This war, like Japan's aggression against China, which began in 1937, and the Spanish Civil War of 1936-1939, in which volunteers from virtually all over the world took part on one side or the other, considered by many historians to be a harbinger of World War II. And some are even inclined to attribute the date of the beginning of World War II to the Italian aggression against Abyssinia. That's what Ethiopia was called back then, or to the date of Japanese aggression in China. The world press called this shameful war of fascist Italy a massacre, and for good reason. Italian colonial fascism showed itself here in all its glory. Duce, which means leader, Benito Mussolini, head of the National Fascist Party of Italy, NFP, prime minister and sovereign dictator of the country, dreamed of the revival of the great Roman Empire. However, without comparing his appetites with the reality, and most importantly, without thinking of consequences. The fascist regime established in Italy since 1922 tried to pursue an aggressive colonial policy, justifying it with theories of racial superiority, as in Nazi Germany. Mussolini promised the Italians a paradise life, naturally at the expense of robbing other nations. However, this was not stated directly, it was about the establishment of a new just order. But everyone understood what was really being said. The Italian elite, like the German elite, deprived of colonies, was jealous of the British and French colonial empires and, of course, Italian fascists dreamed of colonial robbery. As in Germany, parts of the Italian population shared similar aspirations of the Italian capitalists in ruling circles. To be fair, it should be said that not all Italians wanted their country to share the fate of the conquering colonial power. And not everyone supported Mussolini's fascist regime. Unlike Germany, in Italy the opposition was stronger. But for the time being, Mussolini managed to suppress it, both with the help of propaganda and repression. Abyssinia As for Ethiopia, which was called Abyssinia, this large African country along with small Liberia remained practically the only African territory relatively independent of the colonial powers. The country was formed in the second half of the 19th century from individual principalities. Despite the fact that Ethiopia has an ancient history, the country was finally united under Negus, which means Emperor Menelik II, at the end of the 19th century. At the same time, it remained a backward feudal empire in which elements of slavery continued to exist. However, Ethiopia managed to defeat the Italian colonial troops during the First Italo-Abyssinian War of 1895-1896. The Italian then were content to capture Eritrea, the coastal strip of land that separated Ethiopia from the sea. Emperor Haile Selassie I, who reigned in Ethiopia since 1930, began to implement a number of reforms, including in the army. But the reforms were slow affected by the inertia of the old feudal nobility, which had great influence in the affairs of the state and controlled the provinces, regions. Balance of power Italy already had colonies located at the borders of Ethiopia. This is the so-called Italian Eritrea, in the north cutting off Ethiopia from access to the sea, and Italian Somalia, located on the southern borders of the African state. But Mussolini was impatient to quickly begin to create a great colonial empire and, at the same time, wash away the shame of the defeat of the First Italo-Ethiopian War. At the beginning of the conflict, the balance of power was approximately as follows. Italy had 210,000 soldiers and officers of the Italian army, 15,000 so-called black shirts, ideological fascist volunteers, and 50,000 native troops, Somali and Eritrean mercenaries. This army had 150 tank kits, 150 aircrafts, 700 artillery guns and mortars, and 6,000 machine guns. The weapons, for those times especially in African conditions, were quite decent, just like the army itself. And this is only in Eritrea alone. In the southern direction, in Somalia, there were two more Blackshore divisions, a mountain artillery division, a machine gun battalion, and a native infantry brigade. Italian troops in Eritrea Northern Front, were commanded by Marshal Emilio de Bono. In Somalia, Southern Front, by General Rodolfo Graziani. Mussolini entrusted the overall leadership of the operation to Marshal Alessandro Badoglio. The total number of invasion troops was approximately 358,000. This colonial army was opposed by Ethiopia had 450,000 people, 
the size of the entire Ethiopian army. Here it must be said that there were few regular troops, that is a real army, only about 100,000 people, plus 10,000 of emperor's personal guard. The rest of the fighters, as they would now say, were parts of territorial defense. In Ethiopia, each Rais, a large feudal lord and at the same time the ruler of the region, brought his own militia. There were 500,000 rifles for the entire army, three quarters of which were produced at the end of the 19th century. There were also 200 artillery guns of the early 20th century, as well as 50 anti-aircraft guns and 300 machine guns of various companies and years of manufacture. In command was Nigas himself. And also on the side of the emperor's army was the spirit of the real warriors and rebellious people of Ethiopia. Beginning of the invasion The invasion of the Italian aggressors began from two directions at once. From the north, from Eritrea, northern front, with the main forces, and from the south, from Somalia, southern front. In the early morning of October 3, 1935, Italian artillery and aircraft began bombing the border areas of cities of Ethiopia and the Italian army without declaring war, that is when the fascist tradition of a surprise attack was laid, crossed the border and began moving through the territory of the country. We will not delve in the list of operations and the course of hostilities. However, we would like to dwell in more detail on the methods of war that the Italian fascist regime used in Ethiopia. It should be said right away that Mussolini did not have a victorious war. Despite the overwhelming superiority in the technical equipment of the ground forces and complete air supremacy, the Ethiopian patriots still offered the Italian invaders a stubborn resistance, cause of defeat. The factor of the tribal and feudal disagreements and sometimes outright hostility that reigned in the Negus army played into the hands of the Italians. Various feudal groups were very jealous of each other's successes and failures. The inconsistency of the actions of the Ethiopian military leaders became the main problem of the Ethiopian army. In addition, the Ethiopians were dressed in white cotton uniforms and their militia wore traditional white clothes. That is, there is no point in talking about any camouflage in the ranks of the Ethiopian army. As a result, the Ethiopian troops suffered heavy losses. But the losses of the Italian aggressors greatly surprised and discouraged them. Although Italian propaganda produced generally acceptable figures, the ubiquitous British and French intelligence agencies as a rule did not agree with them. By the beginning of the next year and the end of the four months of war, the Italians had not taken the capital of Ethiopia, the city of Addis Ababa. Mussolini was furious. Mussolini removed Marshal de Bono from the leadership of the main Northern Front and demanded that Marshal Badoglio put an end to those Abyssinian warriors as quickly as possible by any means. The Italian generals were not particularly picking their methods. At the first failures, the Italian army began to use chemical weapons, shells and bombs filled with mustard gas, leucide, phosgene and chloropicon. By using these types of weapons, Italy grossly violated the Geneva Convention of 1928, which it signed, prohibiting the use of toxic substances. By April, there was already a half million strong Italian army in Ethiopia, equipped with the most modern weapons, chemical gases and liquids, with which they literally flooded the Ethiopian soil. The Ethiopian army, armed with outdated weapons and insufficiently organized, nevertheless showed strong resistance to the fascist aggressors, in some places even launching counterattacks and liberating cities already occupied by the fascists. But against chemical weapons, the Ethiopian warriors, barefoot and without means of protection, were simply powerless. Summing up, Nigus Haile Selassie, already in exile at a press conference in London, said, We attacked the enemy's machine gun nests, their artillery, captured tanks without bare hands, we endured regular aerial bombardments, but we could not do anything against the poisonous gases that imperceptibly fell on our faces and hands. We dropped our rifles and closed our eyes. A barely noticeable rain showered our army. It showered our bodies, our crops, our livestock and our children. We were literally blinded by mustard gas. White spots and blisters appeared on our bodies, and after 20-30 minutes, Painful death occurred, but we were barefoot. So many people died that I don't even have the courage to name their number. The Italian general staff, 
fearing a loss as a result of the outflanking maneuver of our troops at Mikel, and after the displacement of Italian troops from Shire, used the method of chemical warfare against which no nation is able to fight without the necessary technical means of defense. Airplanes equipped with spraying devices carried out raids in flocks of 9, 15, 18 aircrafts. The distance between them was calculated so that a continuous air rain cloud was created in the air. There was no escape. Any living creature affected by such rain or consuming poison water or food was doomed. And here is how, against the background of these words, the statements of Mussolini's own sons, Bruno and Vittorio, who served in the Italian aviation and participated in this massacre, sound. We organized a lovely hunt for whole crowds of savages. Hundreds and thousands exterminating them with incendiary and chemical bombs and onboard weapons of our aircraft. The Italian fascists developing the technology for future genocide wars behaved like real barbarians in Abyssinia. They made no distinction between children, women, and men. Ethiopians were not considered people from the point of view of fascist ideology. But even this, for the Italian fascists, was not enough. Having occupied the capital of the country, the city of Addis Ababa, they immediately began to terrorize the local population. Over three days of endless massacres, the invaders killed from 15 to 20,000 civilians of the city. The tone was, of course, set by the black shirts of the FNP, an analog of the German SS. Naturally, the most severe terror was accompanied by robbery. During the war, Ethiopia lost 250,000 people. Italian losses were estimated at around 10,000. During the Italian occupation, that is, for almost five years, 760,000 inhabitants of the country died. The people of Ethiopia, in addition to demographic and natural damage, suffered economic damage of almost $800 million at the 1947 exchange rate. In his appeal to the League of Nations, the Ethiopian Nigas Haile Selassie wrote that if the world does not support the people of Ethiopia and allows them to be enslaved and robbed, then, subsequently, the whole world will become a victim of predators. The predictions of the Ethiopian Nigas turned out to be prophetic. Quite a few years will pass and the world will plunge into the abyss of grief and the suffering of some from the outrage and inhumanity of others.